Uh, so it's uh, my privilege and honor to uh, uh, share um, uh, the introduction for, for David Abrahamson, who comes to us from the University of Queensland in Australia. So he has traveled a very long distance um, uh, for that. Uh, David has been involved with high performance computing for uh, more decades than I'll announce here tonight. Um, uh, but he is a uh, professor who specializes in computer architecture and high performance computing research. Uh, he uh, held appointments at Monash University in Australia, uh, Griffith University, Cicero, which is a uh, nationwide research organization in, in other places. Uh, he currently is the director of uh, University of Queensland Center for Research in Computing and a professor in the School of uh, Information Technologies. So he's gonna share his views. Uh, one of the things we're trying to do is share different views of what the future looks like and uh, David will uh, share his view with us today. So thank you very much. Help me welcome David up to the platform and uh, appreciate how long he has jet lag to get here. Thanks, Bill. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you, Bill. Thanks for the introduction. And uh, let me start by saying I'm really delighted to be here. Uh, it's a great event, and um, I've heard some great talks and met some uh, very interesting people. So from my point of view, it's been a great success. Let's see by the end of the night whether you think it's a great success for you. <laughs> um, I particularly want to thank Bill for asking me to speak. Um, and I have traveled quite a long way. So in fact, I surprised someone yesterday and said, look, I'm, I've been in San Diego. I came across to San Diego. I've been in San Diego for about a week, um, and then I'm heading off through the East Coast to ISC in Frankfurt. And this person was quite surprised to realize that this is actually kind of on the way. <laughs> if you draw a line through Australia and back out to Europe, it's, it's as good as it gets. Um, so, an after dinner talk. Well, that was not what um, I thought I was doing. So Bill very kindly asked me to speak and we discussed the topic. And um, I've been working in the area of software tools for parallel machines for, as you say, too many decades. Um, and I said, well, I can talk about our work in debugging. So that was fine. We agreed on a, on a talk and a format and a duration. And um, then I find I'm giving an after dinner talk on debugging. Now, <laughs> You know, surprisingly enough, not everybody thinks debugging is really sexy. <laughs> and uh, if you fall asleep, well, you know, <laughs> I'll try and avoid that, but um, I guess that's possible. So uh, I thought I'd start actually with some things I could talk about, which would be much better after dinner talks. <laughs> so do you know that I'm actually a Windows expert? Um, in fact, these are some of my stained glass windows that I make as a hobby. And that's a great hobby, because it has absolutely nothing to do with supercomputing. <laughs> so you can go out to the shed and, and uh, put these things together and have a lot of fun, except when you break the glass. Um, and it's got nothing to do with debugging. <laughs> if the glass, sh glass shatters, that's just too bad. So I could have talked about that for half an hour. Um, and just to prove it's got nothing to do with, with uh, computing. So that is a soldering iron. Um, <laughs> And, and if you know anything about soldering electronics, you'd know you wouldn't use something of that scale on the types of chips that Pete Ungaro was talking about this morning. It would be quite fatal. Um, I could also have talked about something quite different. I think, Bill, maybe for a future thing, we could arrange a quite different after-dinner event. So I wrote a play about uh, three years ago called Purely Academic. It was a, an out-of-body experience, nothing to do with my skill set. But having been in academia for many decades, um, I, there's nothing I haven't seen. So this play is about the darker side of academia and, um, and some of the practices that we, we perhaps don't, uh, don't, don't exactly uh, hold up there as the best practice. Um, so if you want a copy of it and you want something to read on the way home, shoot me an email. I'm happy to have you. <laughs> it's about an hour and a half read, so that would get you most places in the US. Uh, but we did perform this in Oxford. Um, there was been one performance at a workshop. And uh, anyhow, that was a lot of fun. So the real thing is that bugs and dinner don't really mix. So I did a little bit of, a little bit of homework. 
Did anybody get anything like that on their plate tonight? Um, so it's probably not something you'd normally mix with food. But actually, that's not quite true. Um, so in Brisbane is actually slightly off the coast of the Moreton Bay, um, which is the, the, the bay around the, the coast of Brisbane. Uh, and there's a particular sort of lobster called the Moreton Bay bug. I kid you not. Um, and so there is, there is actually, people do uh, to try and eat those bugs and catch them for that matter. Um, does anyone know how you actually catch those bugs? We don't use a debugger. You use something a bit like that, actually. So there is apparatus for these things. All right, so let me be a little bit more serious for a while. I'll try, I'll try <laughs> and keep you awake. So I don't know whether this quote is, is really um, attributed to Dijkstra. I think uh, the trouble with quotes is sometimes they are, sometimes they aren't. But I did an internet search. Um, so if debugging is the process of removing the bugs, then of course what you all do um, is place those bugs there. Uh, and would anyone like to have a guess of what's the state of the art in debugging? You're all, many of you are application programmers. So what's the state of the art? Yep. Right. OK. <laughs> so maybe that's why Bill said, well, maybe you shouldn't talk about debugging. Because <laughs> no one uses a debugger. And hopefully by the end of the talk, you, you may have changed your mind. But um, that's right, so the print statement. Now, the particular sort of work uh, debugging that we're talking about is my program used to work, and now it doesn't. So what's the state of the art in that sort of debugging? Well, it's the print statement. <laughs> and that's probably about as sophisticated as it gets. So I have spent decades trying to improve this. Um, and I'll show you a few slides here that actually do go back uh, decades, um, and some more recent work as well. But what we've been trying to do is support this process. Yep. <laughs> Have you got another blue water bottle you can give this man? <laughs> well, I can hardly see what's written there, but anyway. So, so we're trying to... I can't see either there or here, so I'm not sure what's on these slides. Um, we're particularly interested in the sorts of codes that you guys write and the sorts of machines that you program, so very large machines. Um, and there are really two main significant challenges there. Um, one of them is what I call a cognitive challenge, and the other one is more of a performance challenge. So the, the cognitive challenge is just that the, the structures that we're dealing with and the machines that we're dealing with are so large that you can't sensibly do prints. I mean, the, the reality is that people do much more sophisticated things even using the programming languages than that. Um, and, and so we've got a very large number of processes and we've got enormous data structures. And the to I don't have to tell anybody here in this room those data structures are full of floating point numbers and you're just not going to look at them. Um, so the cognitive challenge really is getting your head around what is the program state. And let's face it, the most sophisticated debugging has been around understanding the state of my code. What's it actually doing at this point in time? Um, heterogeneity makes that worse. Um, and as we'll, you'll see, by the time I get to the end of the talk, I will say some things about exascale. Uh, and of course, we all expect heterogeneity to get more significant. The other, uh, the other challenge is the performance challenge. Let's say I could do something about uh, this cognitive challenge by using the machine in some better way. And that's really what we've been trying to do. But the data structures are large and the machine is large. And so reasoning around the state of that becomes huge. And so you've really got these two things that as you try and do more sophisticated stuff with the state, um, it gets more expensive. And so really for the last 10 years, we've been trying to work out how to scale some of these techniques. Um, I, I will say something about exascale, but that's not going to make it better. So everything we're doing in the machine domain uh, and the programming environments to allow us to solve these very large problems just makes this de debugging challenge even worse. So we came up with a paradigm. It's now called comparative debugging. When we started it, we called it relative debugging. I once got a review on a paper. It says, my relatives don't need debugging. And so what are you talking about? Um, so we've changed the name. 
uh, and it's, it's trying to address, it's trying to address this, this challenge, and that is that these, these codes, uh, I heard someone yesterday talking about the codes being, uh, well, last night Bill Gropp talked about his code being 20 years old, and some of the, the you know, the, the others are 30 or 40 years old. Uh, and so they're constantly evolving and the hardware's moving along, we all know that. Um, so I've got to move the codes around these different platforms. Does that sound like a problem that we're all dealing with? Um, we've been dealing with for a while. So machines change, algorithms change, we want to swap in and out new algorithms, uh, and user requirements change. And so the problem is, of course, that the errors are often very subtle, and programmers spend a lot of time trying to find them. We try and identify the source of the discrepancies uh, and follow that back to the source. Now, trying to do that with print statements clearly doesn't work. Trying to do it with GDB clearly doesn't work. Uh, trying to even do it with total view and, and uh, DDT and parallel debuggers also doesn't really work at that scale. So the whole idea about comparative debugging is very simple, actually conceptually incredibly simple. The devil is in the detail of the implementation. Um, so the problem is that we have two applications, and one we'll call a reference code, and one we'll call uh, the, the erroneous code. So we've done something to that, or maybe we did nothing, came in next morning and it didn't work. Um, and what we want to do is iterate around looking at the state between one code and the other code, trying to understand where they diverge. Now, I don't know whether there's, there's a few people in this room, I suspect, who can remember how did engineers use to fit, fix television sets or radios? You remember walking into the place where someone was fixing a TV set and they'd have, a, they'd have the back off and they'd have a scope and they'd be looking at some signals. And more often than not, they'd actually have two sets there, one that worked and one that didn't. And so they're comparing around that where it's what, whether the signals look the same. So this, this idea, of course, is not new. It's just that we haven't done it on software systems. I want to know when these two codes diverge. So the whole idea is to specify the conditions under which the new program diverges from the old one. Um, and so we have a debugger that looks like any other debugger, um, but it has some additional commands to allow us to actually cause that to happen. So it keeps track of breakpoints. Uh, it performs comparisons automatically uh, and then returns to col control to the user. So if the two programs have got the same state for the variables you're looking at, then it'll keep going. And if they're different, it'll report it. Now, when it reports it as different, it drops back into a more conventional debugging mode and you start to do things, looking at why things might, in fact, be different. Um, so if you look at the statement at the bottom, and that's a, a uh, the syntax of of an assertion, so we place what we call assertions. These assertions are declarative. I make them at some time before I start the codes running, and I say things like data structure big should equal data structure small at these places. The handle that you get on, the temporal handle that you get on when they should be compared is, act is actually done through breakpoints. The debugger plans breakpoints, it does comparisons for us and, and returns results. It's, it's conceptually very simple. Now, why does it work? Well, it works because we can do iterative refinement on the region that we're looking at. Black code and right white code are returning different results, so I iterate around, I recursively define, refine the region over which these two codes are differing. So they start out, the answer's wrong, and then I start looking at the internal state, and not all of the internal state, I'm going to look at key variables. So if the answer is derived from if A equals B plus C and A is wrong, then B or C are wrong. So I go and look at the def points for B and C and wire my way back through the code. And so it's no great surprise that in a very short amount of time, I've refined that region down to something quite small. I can start with a million lines and get down to a page of code quite quickly. Now, people do this already manually, I'm sure using different techniques. What we've done is added into the debugger just a couple of extra statements to try and do that. I do want to say something about visualization of errors, uh, and this goes along with the paradigm. And again, this is probably something that some of you do from time to time, with a difference that what we've looked at is the visualization of the errors themselves, 
rather than visualization of the data structures. So it's a subtle shift. I can report errors in any number of ways. If the error is around a scalar, then fine, report the scalars. Of course, for all of the applications that I've heard you talking about in the last few days, the errors are not around simple scalars. And so we can use advanced visualization tools to try and look at where things are in fact differing. So for arrays, 2D arrays, you can draw pixel maps. For 3D arrays, you can draw three-dimensional structures with ISO surfaces. Um, and uh, so I'll talk in a moment about an, uh, another uh, form of assertion we've got that even allows you to talk about statist statistical tests. So some of these graphs are quite old. This, is, this is, uh, actually is two decades old. <laughs> Um, and it's some work we did with um, Ian Foster and his group at Argonne on trying to debug what happened when one, uh, I think it was MM5 code was parallelized to MPMM. So going from a climate model that's sequential to one that's parallel. And there were subtle errors, quite subtle differences. And I think the dominant belief was that it was just differences in floating point representations causing these things to do different things. And I'll come, on that, come back to that in a moment. So what we did was we looked at this as, in fact, the temperature variable being visualized between the two codes, but it's not the temperature surface, it's the difference. So you take the temperature in one model, you take the temperature in the other, and you subtract them, and then you compute an ISO surface, and then you visualize it. Now, I took this and showed it to another colleague in, in Australia who works in climate models. He didn't know these two, two codes at all, and he said, well, actually, I think you've got two errors. And he said, look, I think one of them's probably in the physics to do around solar radiation, and the other one's probably to do with some physics around the ground. That is phenomenal, right? He had not seen the codes. I showed him this movie, um, which I should have explained as a time varying, as it's time stepping uh, movie on what was going on. Now, what was it that allowed him to actually make that statement? Well, if, you, if I just go back and show that movie, is he? No, it's not going to play. Um, you actually see these two isosurfaces growing out of different regions. One of them starting at the bottom, and the other one starting at the top. This is time-stepping finite difference code. You can't in one time step get from the bottom of the atmosphere to the top of the atmosphere. And he knew that there was different physics codes in those two places. So he was actually fairly certain that probably there were two different errors and that they were, in fact, evolving separately. Uh, and he was right. As it turned out, there was one in the planetary boundary layer physics, um, and the other one was in the solar radiation code. Two quite separate errors. So visualization can play an enormous role in this, in this uh, activity. This is another example where we were looking at a smooth particle hydrodynamics code, a 2D version um, of a, a brick being dropped into a tank of fluid or uh, uh, particles. So, and then it was, we parallelized this code. And the blue diagram and the red diagram show the state of this code at a particular time step. Now, you can do the Where's Wally um, game, if you like. Is that a game in the US? Kids look at? How do these two pictures differ? Uh, where's Waldo? OK, well, we have Wally. <laughs> That's a more Australian, I guess. <laughs> um, and you probably, if you stare at that for a little bit of time, you'll probably pick out the outliers and show me where they're different. But on the right-hand side, I'm actually showing a movie, in fact, of not those two uh, particles, but the, the difference in positions of the particles, visualized um, actually in the size of the glyph and the color by the magnitude. And so if you, again, if you watch that movie for a little while, you'll see that what happens is the error surface actually starts out in a particular place and then propagates out through, through, the, uh, through the entire space. I don't know whether you caught it there, but it actually started out, as it turned out, just where we had a decomposition operation around, this was a four processor code. So if I told you that there was an error starting around the place that I had message passing going on, what would you guess? probably something going wrong with the exchange values across those two. And again, that was in fact what we were seeing. So looking at those errors actually tells you quite a lot about where things are going wrong. I should keep an eye on my time too, shouldn't I? 
Um, okay, so let me say something about scalability. It turns out that the idea sounds great, but intrinsically that's not terribly scalable. So this is how we built it in the first case. And this complicated looking diagram um, says that, I can't read what I'm looking at, so, uh, says that we, we want to um, take the data out of the data structures, combine them into one, and then compare them. So there's three phases of operations. You've got this data structure, it's distributed across the machine, pull the results back, put it back together, and do the comparison. Well, that was great up to about four processes. Uh, and in fact, it even worked nicely between machines. Was I ported something from one machine to another, I could do that sort of thing. Um, clearly, that doesn't scale for a few reasons. Number one, you're pulling the data structures back into a, the head node and doing a sequen sequential comparison. Um, but What's worse, of course, is you're trying to pull huge data structures back together and put them, glue them back together. Now, I, I know a lot of you parallelize the code as much for anything to get the, the data size the way you want it and use the distributed memories. So clearly that's not gonna work. Uh, and this is, in fact, when we started working with Cray to work out how we could scale this to large machines. This complicated looking picture is one of our solutions. And again, I, I don't have time and you're probably not interested in the, the detailed technicalities of how that works, but uh, we experimented with a technique that turns out to work quite well, which involves hashing signatures. So I've got a data structure, it's distributed across the machine, I hash it up, I produce a signature, and I pull the signatures back into the head node. Those signatures are now very small, um, and so the data transport cost of pulling them into the head node is small, and the amount of work you have to do to do the comparison is also very small. And it turns out that scales quite nicely, the hashing goes in parallel, the only bit that's sequential is the data comparison back in the head node. Now, I'm sure you all have immediately said, well, hang on, what about? <laughs> There's a whole stack of caveats around that. We did quite a lot of work to work out when hashing works. Uh, and you can, you can actually do quite a good job. It's not exactly the same as just subtracting the two data structures, um, but you can get, east. all you want is a signal to say, I think something's broken here. Go away and have a, need, a better look. So that's one approach, and it turns out that scales quite nicely. Um, the other one is, in fact, to say, look, the data structure is distributed across the machine. Why don't you just use the network in the machine to do the comparisons? So for pairwise processes, pull the data back together and do the comparison in one or the other. Um, and, and actually, what I should have pointed out in the last one is that the hashing, I did say, goes in parallel, but just think about what that means. It means that the hashing is going in parallel. I'm using the machine a parallel machine, which arguably might be sitting there doing nothing stuck at breakpoints, to run the debugger. And so my performance challenge that I mentioned earlier on um, is all about using the parallel machine. So that's kind of cool. Um, likewise, when I pull the data structures apart and I don't put them back together, I just do direct comparisons, I'm also using the parallel machine and I'm using the network in the machine. And it is, in fact, a parallel program. Um, now, again, uh, there's a whole stack of complexity in there. You say to me, can I debug a program that's running on 100,000 cores against one that's running on 50,000 cores? Data decomposition's different. Turns out for a whole stack of useful um, templates, you can. And, and again, there's a lot of devil in the detail. One of my guys got a PhD for working all of that out. Um, but again, that seems to work quite well. Let me suddenly say something about heterogeneity because it was a problem when we were porting from machine A to machine B. It went away for a while. Our parallel machines were nice and homogeneous. All the processes were the same. Uh, but guess what? They're getting, more, they're getting more heterogeneous. So one of the things we did very early on was abstract the data into an architecture-independent form. That means I could compare machines with big endy and little endy, and I could compare machines with data structure sizes, uh, data sizes and types that were different and I could um, co coalesce them into a form in which they could be compared. So that's, um, that's been something we've done all along. Um, we nearly threw it out because, as I said, machines got very homogeneous. But I think the heterogeneity that's back in there in the machines, um, we can't ignore. If I stop talking for more than a few seconds, I usually get questions about well, what do you mean by comparisons? And again, there's a lot of complexity in this, but the most important issue here is that we don't compare for absolute equality, we compare with the tolerances. 
And so I don't have to expect two, days, two, two data values to be identical. I can specify a tolerance, either relative or absolute, and say they have to be within this. Uh, and that turns out to be essential in debugging real codes across real machines. Um, you can also do a lot of things with the data structures themselves and the, and the array types to say they don't actually have to be identical either, as long as there's a way, in fact, of conforming one to the other. So um, in principle, and we've done, we've had implementations that do this, I could go from row major to column major and have the debugger flip it around, as long as I know there's a one-to-one -one point of comparison between each of those data structures. Um, we've even worked out how to uh, compare structures, dynamic structures, and did some work with linked lists and, and more complex types. Uh, now, not all of those things have survived in, through into the current implementation, but along the way we've tested them. There are programming languages, apparently, other than C or Fortran. Uh, and so we've been doing some work very recently with Cray to look at can I compare across programming languages. In fact, we did some work some years back on comparing an experimental language called ZPL with C codes. And some of you might know ZPL is the precursor to Chapel, which is the language that Cray is currently working on. Uh, and so one of the nice things about those languages is a lot of the uh, metadata about the data is held by the compiler. The complexity with MPI codes is that programmers can do anything in distributing the data, and you actually have to tell the debugger, this is how it got decomposed. Well, if I'm working in, say, UPC, which is a global um, address space language, the compiler is the part that knows where the data got split and where it got sent. Uh, and so you can, the debugger can interrogate the compiler and say, well, what have you done with this data structure? And it'll say, I split it up block star or something. Um, so that allows me to compare MPI programs with UPC programs. It allows me to compare OpenACC or OpenMP programs with UPC. And we had a paper in last year's supercomputing with some early results on how that works out. Um, again, there's a lot of caveats in everything I'm saying. It's not easy, and there are certainly cases that just don't work. But what we're trying to do is hit some of the more common ones. Um, what if you don't have a reference code? It's all very well for me to say, compare a, a test code with a reference code. Now, this is, this is definitely at the experimental end of things, but we've been playing around with assertions that don't use a reference code. And these are called statistical assertions. And they allow me to say things about the state of a data structure in statistical terms. For example, compute the mean. If it's a pressure array, compute the mean pressure. And then allow me to say things like, well, the pressure shouldn't go outside these bounds. How do I know what good bounds are? Well, I don't, right? But I might have some inkling as to what good values are. If the code is supposed to be conserving energy, I should be able to write an assertion that says it's conserving energy. And so we can have assertions that track time in time step codes as well as sort of spatially within the data, uh, within the time step, and I can say things about those. Now, we haven't worked all of this out. We've played around with some concepts. Um, but there's a couple of examples where we've used this to advantage. Um, the red uh, distributions show the distribution of particle speeds in a particle code and one is erroneous and one is not. Well, you look at those and you say, there shouldn't be many high-speed particles. They should be all around some mean value with a distribution like this. And so this allows me to automatically detect that some of these have gone outside those bounds. Um, the right-hand graph is one from some work we did with lamps to say, look, these are also distributions of the way the particles should be behaving. So that's sort of experimental, and there are lots more caveats on when you can use that and when you can't. But think about your codes, and you know a lot about the physics in them. There are things you can say about, about um, I'm sure, about whether they're in fact correct or not. Um, OK, so let me sort of get close to the end and tell you just something about status and implementation. Um, as I said, we've been working with Cray for a number of years, and there is a version of this on Blue Waters, in fact. How many people knew that? <laughs> so it's called CCDB. I want you to all go back out and look at the man page on CCDB. <laughs> CCDB doesn't have all of the stuff I've talked about, so you might want to beat up Cray if it doesn't do the things you want it to do. But we can certainly, uh, the current implementation certainly handles um, 
the, the assertions between programs. It does that in a reasonably scalable way. Uh, and, um, and in fact, it's a, as a parallel debugger, it's actually moderately scalable too. It's a command line tool. Uh, there is a GUI that Cray have put on top of it for helping you. Um, so you should go and have a play with that. It's, it's pluggable. Um, it has a client server architecture. The underlying debugger is sitting on GDB. Surprise, surprise, if you do debuggers, that's what you do. Everyone inherits GDB as the basic tool and builds on top of it. Um, and, and I'm not going to claim that it's scaling to infinity. It's not the, uh, the superhero of debugging, um, but it certainly seems to scale reasonably well for some of the codes. Um, we've mixed it and used it with the GPUs. And again, we base uh, the debug server on top of the client on top of um, a GDP server. So let me finish with um, what I started out with. The question is, does this scale to infinity beyond? And we're all worrying about what these exascale machines are going to look like. And I think there's more experts in this room than me on what exascale was going to look like. But the machines are probably big, probably bigger than Blue Waters, or certainly in terms of the number of bits in the moving parts in there. They're probably heterogeneous. There may be mixed precision in there. Um, they're probably going to have, you heard uh, Pete Ungaro this morning say, they're probably going to have hierarchical memories deeper than we currently have to handle. Uh, what do we know about our algorithms? Then certainly a lot of people are talking about loose synchronization uh, and handling fault tolerance. Something is going to fail in the machine at some point. So it was a quite nice uh, tech report um, put out a few years ago now on what this might mean for debugging tools. Uh, and again, it, it really just maps those onto what the debugger might have to do. So clearly, you want a scalable debugging technique. It's got to scale itself across the machine. If you make it smarter and, and more complicated, it also has to scale. Um, you have to debug hybrid and heterogeneous architectures. You've got to handle this deep hierarchy of memory. Um, there may be domain-specific languages involved, like uh, OpenACC and the like. You may have mixed precision arithmetic. Um, it may be adaptive because of handling failures, uh, and you might want correctness tools as well. So if we have a look at the work we've been doing and say, well, how do we actually match up on that? I am not claiming that we have an operational um, exascale debugger. But I think some of the ideas we've been working on may well scale out to that. So we know how to scale the debugging techniques. Uh, we do know something about heterogeneity and mapping things into this architecture independent form to make them uh, architecture neutral. Um, with the work we've been doing on, on the GPUs and the Cray platforms, we've been handling some level of specialized memory systems. Um, we've been working with a number of the parallel programming languages that are around. Um, we do handle mixed precision arithmetic. I'm not going to claim that we've done anything great in terms of adaptive systems. If a process suddenly dies and is reinstantiated somewhere else, I think the debugger is probably going to get quite confused. Uh, and um, we certainly don't do much in by way of correctness, although the whole idea of assertions against statistical distributions um, is kind of an interesting one to play with there. I think the, the belief is that as we move software to the exascale, we're just going to have to get used to the fact that no two, two runs are going to be exactly the same. And so being able to say, but the mean value should be the same, or the standard deviation of this should be so small, or it should have this probability distribution, is an interesting way to think about it. So, well, you've had your dessert, um, but another Google search suggested that there are, in fact, quite a few desserts that involve bugs. On that note, I shall finish. <laughs> So first off, I want to thank David for, for a great talk um, and being so flexible because uh, when we, as he said, when we first talked about him coming to talk, he thought it would be in a different uh, format. But um, as different schedules got there and people came in when he was very flexible and in helping us uh, accommodate that. Uh, but I do want to uh, start with a question about what is a spotted dick? <laughs> <laughs> 
I think it's whatever you want it to be. I don't okay, know. Okay, all right. Well, <laughs> I, I didn't know what kind of bug that was, but uh, I, I noticed that down, yeah. down, down there. Yeah. Heinz makes it, so it must be good for you, uh, one way or the other. So um, uh, I want to see if there's any questions uh, from, uh, from you all. A uh, couple over there. When May always goes first, because his hand is up all the time. And we can talk about um, stained glass windows if you prefer. That's, <laughs> that's cool. David, uh, great talk. So the, my question is that um, uh, when you look at the uh, from your practice, uh, practical experience, how many of these bugs really need to be found at uh, the full scale? And how many of them can actually be isolated with the smaller scale execution? So that's, so that's a great question. And I, I suspect you can answer that, right? Because it's. <laughs> It's a rhetorical question to some extent. Nobody debugs at scale if they don't have to. Um, I'm sure Bill would kill, kill you all if you took over a couple hundred thousand nodes and sat there with it doing nothing. Um, so for those bugs, of course, debug them at small. Um, but it still should be, it still could, we couldn't get an, an unoptimized implementation to scale more than a few processes, right? So you probably want to debug on 30, 60, you maybe are not, not be able to reduce the data structure size too. Um, so you probably want, so you need most of the techniques we've built into this just to get to even a small number of calls. Um, and there was something else I was gonna say about that, and it slipped my mind, but um, I might come back later. Um, so I often think of fixing bugs and adding features as sort of two sides of the same coin. Um, and if we think back to the Dextra's quote, um, just wondering if, <coughs> you know, assuming that if we're trying to add an enhancement that we're likely to be introducing a bug in the process. Um, uh, in the case where you don't have a reference code available, uh, I guess what I'm wondering is, could we use the approach that you're taking to kind of do a sort of test-driven development cycle so that when you're adding um, features, you're sort of fixing the bugs that you're introducing as you Well, do right, so in fact, sometimes we call this actually a test-type test, a test type strategy, and in fact, if you think about it, it's not, dis, it's not dissimilar to sort of black box and white box testing strategies. Certainly when you start to say things like, I can write an assertion about the mean or the standard deviation of this data structure. So I think you're, you're spot on there. Um, but the other thing is sometimes you add new features and the new features don't work, that's okay. But if they've broken the old features, then I wanna at least start by debugging the old features and move forward. Um, so so I, I can't stress strongly enough that this doesn't solve all the problems. And I'm not standing up here telling you that I can solve all your problems. But this is a missing tool in the tool chest. And so that's kinda nice niche. Um, can I just say the other problem with debuggers is that People resort to tools like printf because that's what they've got and they don't want to learn another whole tool. Um, and so, you know, it's like if, you, if you've got a can to open and you've got, you don't have a can opener, but you've got a screwdriver, you'll probably get the can open. You might ruin the screwdriver. <laughs> um, and people do that in debugging all the time. So we've taken the approach of building this into an existing debug framework. In our case, it's a command line driven debugger where the, 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 you'd use that as a normal parallel debugger. You could drop it into total view if they wanted to do that. You could drop it into DDT. Um, and then so you've got all of that other stuff there and then this little bit of extra. So you're not learning another whole tool. It's not like going to Valgrind or something when you haven't been doing that. So we've tried to actually lower that, that sort of impedance mismatch there on the incremental cost. So, um, spotted dick is a British pudding made with suet and dried fruit and often served with custard. And I'm a vegetarian, so, you know, there you go. <laughs> All right, Eric always comes through with the proper answer at the proper time, so thank you. <laughs> so this relates to the uh, statistical uh, method. So when I'm teaching, say, programming to, to my students, and I tell them, why don't you check if energy is conserved? And if you find that energy is not conserved, what's the first thing you do? You check your energy calculation, 
right? Because there might be right. a bug right. in the debugger. In fact, a lot uh, of those. Uh, so I'm uh, just wondering, is that no, absolutely bug, the bug, um, debugger an issue? Well, that's exactly what I guess we're suggesting you do. Um, and there's a relationship here between classic programming language assertions, as Dijkstra et al. would have, you know, preconditions and postconditions that people, they've been trying to encourage people to put into their code. So maybe you don't want the debugger to do it, maybe you should have written the code so it's self-checking. Um, this just delays that where you haven't done it. In other words, I can do that test for some of, the th some of those tests in the debugger itself. But that's exactly what I'm suggesting, that you would do that. Um, and yeah, the error could be in the energy code or it could be somewhere back in the physics further down. Um, you may then have to start to think about, well, okay, if the energy is not being conserved, what, what sort of statistical tests would I write on things earlier on? Now, you may not be able to come up with them. Um, by the way, the, the other advantage, not in the statistical area, but the other advantage of this approach is that we've had cases where someone wrote the code, it's 10 years old, it's now been ported by someone completely different without knowledge of the original physics, and they, in many cases, haven't had to understand that. It's just, these two TV sets are different, tell me why. And that's actually really quite empowering. I've seen, I've seen computer scientists without the, without the physics knowledge debug codes that they would never have been able to do if they trying to, had to get their head around astrophysics or some, you know, Einstein's equations or something of the like. So that's also quite empowering. Um, getting back to the issue when May brought up about sc scaling, um, is there any kind of taxonomy or field guide to the bugs that most commonly occur only when you scale the code? I'm not aware of a formal taxonomy. What have we seen? We've seen errors in the communications harnesses where stuff's transferred across processes. Um, stupid expressions that, you know, they take something div A, div B to compute how many are in each bit and those things break. Um, I'm not sure I'm inventing the taxonomy for you on the fly, but uh, I suspect if I weren't around the room, you'd all come up with examples of what's gone wrong in scaling, but um, uh, we've certainly been able to track bugs in scaling. Now, there's a lot that has to happen in the debugger when you do a scaling type test because the scaling is the thing that changes the data distribution often. And so, you know, I haven't told you anything about how I tell the debugger that um, this is an MPI program and this is how the data is distributed. Uh, well, in fact, there's caveats on that, so it has to be regular decompositions. And so I can write HBF style, block star, cyclic or whatever and tell the debugger that in the hope that that's in fact what the program has done. And sometimes that, in fact, well, that wasn't what the programmer did. If the program has just gone randomly scatter, 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 then it, it, we can't help that. Um, and also, when, you, when you're debugging in Chapel or UPC or ZPL or one of these languages that does control the distribution, the debugger can get in under the covers, but if it's not a regular decomposition, it's never going to be efficient enough to pull it back together. So lots of caveats. Um, in the peer-to-peer -peer model where the processes communicate with each other to do those comparisons, uh, you know, if, unless it's going from, you know, 1,000 processes to two, where it's literally you, every two processes is equivalent to one, then that will work. But if it's like, you know, some other funny distribution, then it won't work. So I could give you probably not a half an hour talk on how this should work and then probably a two hour talk on what doesn't work. <laughs> but again, it's just another tool in the toolkit. Uh, do you have a convenient way to embed this kind of technology into test suites that people develop for their code? So you, know, you, you run against a known result, you get answers that are wrong and it immediately tells you here's where you should look at your code, that sort of thing. So we did produce a version of this, it's not in CCDB, but we produced a version where in fact did you notice that the assertion had two halves, right? There's the bit for one code and the bit for the other code. Um, one of the worst things about that is that there are line numbers embedded in there. So you change the code and all your assertions are broken. Um, we did write a version where, in fact, what you put is a pragma in the code and you say hash assert data structure F and hash assert data structure F. And then we had a script that would program that would go through and pull those assertions back together and build the assertions dynamically. Um, that actually lets you do some of that because now I've built the test suite against the reference code. 
We also produced a version that would allow you to capture the state of one of those programs so you didn't have to run it again. Um, we call those ghost processes, and so you'd capture it, you'd store it away, and then the debugger would think it actually had another program there, but it was in fact just pulling it from a file. Um, where doesn't that work? Well, if you create an assertion that wasn't captured, then clearly you, you can't do the comparisons. Um, but yes, and, and we do sometimes call this a hybrid test the verification type thing. Yep. So you, on some of your slides, you talked about discrepancies, and in some of the slides, you talked about errors. And I like the discrepancy part because it's not clear that what you started with was right to begin with. You, all you know is now it's different. So to what extent uh, is an, a certain degree of expertise needed to tell the difference between an outlier and an out and outlier? So great question, Bob, and I didn't plant that one. <laughs> um, you're right, they are discrepancies, they're not errors. And so the, in fact, we, have a, we had a, um, a classic example of this, we took um, simple, how many people know the simple code, you know, simple hydrodynamics bomb code, um, coded in Fortran, I think, and compared it with ZPL, which we did this work with Larry Snyder quite a few years back. We didn't understand the physics, um, and we found four discrepancies. Turns out one of them was in the original code, and three of them were in the refined code, um, because they'd done the physics differently. Do we care? No. What we were able to say is these things are different. Now, what's even more interesting is that the, the common belief at that time was that it was just floating point differences. Well, it wasn't. There was actually a term missing in the expression in the original code that they fixed when they rewrote the code. Um, so you're spot on. Doesn't matter if one TV set's broken and the other one's working, you might discover things about the one you thought was working as well. So do we have any other questions or comments people would like to make? Well, what's even more impressive, Bill, is that these people have, they've got a talk on debugging at dinner time. <laughs> <laughs> I thought Bill Gropp had a hard job last night talking about <laughs> a, a government report, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a good group of people. But um, <laughs> I uh, very much want to thank David for, for uh, being the good sport of being the dinner speaker on a topic like that. You did a great job. Uh, I will look forward to uh, finding uh, Minota Bay bugs. Morton Bay. Morton Bay bugs uh, sometime in the near future uh, uh, to find out what they're like as, as well. In Sydney, they're called Balmain bugs from Balmain. It's different All right. Well, that type of bug actually is pretty attractive to me. So, uh, <laughs> um, so what we try to do with our, our last couple speakers, including David, is give you a little bit of an insight into the challenges as a community we all have into going into the future, right? So uh, challenges Bill talked about, challenges Peter talked about, challenges David talked about, about <laughs> actually making things work in those events. So um, uh, you're, you're rightfully, uh, as Bill said last night, uh, uh, should be scared, but also there's great opportunity in, in, um, in that and um, uh, great potential for being able to do much more of the science that you all want to do. So we're trying to do that. Uh, and uh, hopefully uh, there, there were a few thoughts that were provoked, uh, or at least uh, uh, that you'll have nightmares about uh, tonight when, when, you, when you go to sleep. So thank you very much, David. Thank you.